Fallout 4 takes place in a world where the United States of America had nuclear war with communist China. The story of Fallout is told from the American perspective. Viewers often ask me, well, what about the Chinese perspective? What happened in China during this time? Details are scant, but in Fallout 4, there is one story about a Chinese-American family who lived in downtown Boston before the bombs dropped. If you travel east of Hubris Comics, past Swan's Pond, you find a neon apartments sign collapsed on the ground. Here we find a crumbling building lightly guarded by super mutants. After we kill the super mutants, we can explore the ruins to find a red door leading to an interior called the Pearwood Residences. The Pearwood Residences was an apartment complex before the war. We find ourselves in a hallway lobby entrance that connects many of the different apartment buildings. On this floor, we find the skeleton of a man with his hand in an Edotronic. Looks like he was fishing for food the day the bombs dropped. And all of the floors are wrecked above us, which means the only way to get to the top is to take the elevator, which is on the floor beneath us. This elevator takes us to the top of the building, and then to explore the rest of the residences, we have to hop down from floor to floor. There are many skeletons here in Pearwood residences, but our story about Chinese Americans before the war begins on the second floor down from the top. Going down the hallway and turning right, we enter a young boy's bedroom. We can present Presume that the name of this boy was Kim. On his dresser, we find blocks that spell out the name Kim alongside a baseball glove and a baseball cap. This young boy must have loved baseball. There's a school desk in the corner with a Jangles the Moon Monkey and lots of festive Halloween decorations. Whatever happened to young Kim? To find out, we need to travel far to the southwest, to the ruined town of Natick Banks. Natick Banks is a pretty large town with with lots to explore. There's the Wu family house, a ruined red rocket truck stop, a bookshop, a police station, a church, an antique store, a number of ruined collapsed private residences, a few more private residences that you can explore, an open air marketplace quad surrounded by small shops, including a diner, the Roadside Pines Motel, an abandoned warehouse, and an abandoned power plant. When you arrive, you often find a fight between a Deathclaw and a bunch of super mutants happening in the Marketplace Quad. We also find a number of high-level monsters, including Deathclaws and super mutant behemoths in this area, usually by the power plant. I'm going to explore the entire town while I tell you the story of young Kim and how Chinese Americans were treated by the United States during the Great War. To pick up where we left off, we head to the small ruined house west of the Red Rocket truck stop. As we climb the stairs, we see baseball paraphernalia, a catcher's mitt, a baseball, and when we get to the top floor, we see a very familiar scene. Just like at the Pearwood residences, we find a dresser with the name Kim spelled in blocks. Both places have the same name spelled in blocks, both places have children's toys, and both places have baseball paraphernalia. This must be the room of the same child. We learn more about this child by unlocking the nearby novice locked terminal. Here we find the personal terminal for a boy named Kim Woo. This terminal is heartbreaking. It's a diary of young Kim Woo, which tells the story of how he and his family evaded United States government officials who tried to round them up and inter them in a concentration camp for Chinese Americans. It's written in the first person, very similar to the way that young Anne Frank wrote her diary during World War II. These terminal entries will give chills to anyone who has read young Anne Frank's diary. In the first entry, called The Gate, Kim tells us that a bunch of people destroyed what he describes as an arch just outside his home. This is likely an ornate Chinese gate that we typically find in the Chinatown districts of many large cities. Kim tells us that a bunch of people destroyed this gate and that there were plenty of police there, but they didn't put a stop to it. Young Kim was excited. He was gonna go shopping for Halloween decorations with his family. But after this senseless destruction, he and his family went into their home, locked the doors, and peered out the windows. 
Later that day, a bus showed up right next to his house and many of his neighbors started to pile into the bus. Police then entered the building looking to round up more people and so his mother took him to the roof of the building to hide. He thought that they were playing a game, but his mother made him be very quiet. They stayed there on the roof until it got dark outside. Finally, they went back into their own homes, and then Kim's father, who had been at work all day, came home. When he did, his mother cried and cried. Young Kim didn't realize what was going on. He ends this entry by saying, grown-ups are weird. In this poor child's innocence, he thought that people were playing a game and that his neighbors were just hopping on a bus going somewhere fun. In reality, the government was rounding up Chinese Americans in Chinatown, putting them on buses and using the police force to scour every complex. In his next terminal entry labeled Moving In, we get confirmation of what we just learned. We learn that he did have an old apartment in Pearwood. This directly links this tiny house in Natick with the Pearwood residences in downtown Boston. After their neighbors all got rounded up and sent to the camps, Kim's parents moved their family to live with his uncle Marshall here in Natick Banks. Young Kim still doesn't realize why they had to move. He says, I liked our old apartment in Pearwood. He complains that they don't even have their own rooms in this tiny house. All of these people are packed together. He says it gets hot and smelly. He also doesn't understand why everyone here in Natick Banks is being so weird. One day, his aunt Song never came home. He asked his uncle when Auntie Song was gonna come home, but he refused to answer. Then his mother started crying. Then his cousin, Mikey, got upset, pushed him to the ground and started to beat on him before Kim's father pulled Mikey off and sent him to sit in the corner. He had no idea what was going on. Why did asking about his own Aunt Song cause everyone to get so upset? His father told him later that Aunt Song went away to a camp. Young Kim thought that that sounded fun. Camping is a great time and he had a whole bunch of questions. But Papa said that it wasn't that kind of camp. This isn't a fun camp for kids. No, this is a different kind of a camp for adults. He instructs his son to never bring it up again. Poor Aunt Song. She got rounded up by the police. She got sent to a Chinese-American internment camp. His cousin Mikey snapped because he missed his mom. He didn't know what happened to her. His uncle Marshall was silent because he missed his wife, and he didn't know what was going to happen to her. The next entry is called Jason's Game. There must have been a lot of people packed into this house because they had downstairs neighbors. There was a boy living downstairs named Jason, and Kim really liked to play with Jason. The problem is that one day when Kim was playing with Jason, Jason's big brother came and gave Kim a copy of the Red Menace holotape game. As he gives the tape to Kim, he says, you should learn something from this, directly inferring that the game Red Menace is somehow tied to young Kim. Kim didn't understand it went over his head. In his mind, it was a fun new game. He sat down to play Red Menace until his father arrived. His father became furious and he sent Kim to his room. He made Jason go home and sent the holotape back with him. Then he forbid his son Kim from ever playing with Jason again. From upstairs, Kim could hear his father arguing loudly with his uncle, and they were arguing about the Red Menace game. Kim didn't understand what was going on. He says, I didn't do anything. It's not fair. He just wanted to play the video game. But it's clear that Kim's father understood that this game was just another form of anti-Chinese propaganda, probably funded by the United States government, and that Jason's big brother gave it to Kim and told him to learn something from it as an act of prejudice. The next journal entry is called World Series, and here we learn more about young Kim's love of baseball. The poor kid is devastated. He says, I hate it here. I just want to die. It's the day of the World Series, and Boston is playing. We've learned this elsewhere in the game. In my video on the Boston Bugle Building, we find many terminal entries written by journalists who are excited that the Boston Red Sox are finally in the World Series again. Clearly, young Kim is a baseball fanatic. He's got baseball paraphernalia 
paraphernalia at every residence where he has lived, and he just wants to watch the World Series the Red Sox are playing. But he's not allowed to. He can't go upstairs to where the TV is. His mama says that there are bad people in the neighborhood today and that they shouldn't make a sound. They're stuck in a hidden room all day long. The day of the World Series. We're stuck here again, he says. Clearly they do this kind of hiding fairly often. Other people in the house are watching the TV at full blast, but he still can't clearly hear what's going on. He tried to call the young boy Jason, who lived below, to tell him the score, but his mother got mad at him when she saw him holding the phone. She said that it's silly for him to be worried about such a stupid game. But it's baseball. How can she not get it? Just kill me now, he says. Young Kim is as American as it gets. What is more American than baseball? There's nothing more American than baseball except for maybe apple pie. This young boy just wants to watch the World Series. He's not concerned about Americans and Chinese, capitalists and communists. He doesn't get that he can't watch baseball because people in this world don't think of him as an American the way that he thinks of himself. That he can't watch baseball because there are people in the town of Natick hunting for him. That he has to hide in that dark hole again because if he doesn't, he could get placed on a bus and shipped off to God knows where and never watch baseball again. The next entry is called Sirens. Everything's gone crazy, he says. He was awoken by loud sirens blaring through the streets of Natick Banks. However, this time the sirens never turned off like they normally do. His uncle Marshall ran downstairs and then the entire household heard a huge boom. Young Kim didn't know what was going on. He says, the grown-ups are all arguing about whether or not we should leave. Could this have been the day that the bombs dropped? Or could this have been an explosion from one of the riots? We learn elsewhere that even before the bombs dropped, there were riots in the streets due to the fossil fuel shortage. Whatever this explosion was, it rattled the entire household. The grown-ups were arguing about what they should do about it. In the end, Kim's mother stayed in the house with Kim and his cousin Mikey. His father and his uncle Marshall took all the money they had saved in a jar and left the house to buy food and water. The reality of the situation still hasn't dawned on young Kim. He's too young. He sees his father putting on a huge coat and scarf and says, Daddy looks silly. He doesn't realize that the world that they knew was over forever, that the baseball that he loved would never again be played, and that if the two men in his life didn't leave at that moment to go get food and water, that he would likely die. The final entry is titled, Scary People. I'll read this one word for word. There were people up in the house yesterday who came in while we were sleeping. Someone they brought with them was crying. I think there was a fight. They broke a bunch of stuff and said a lot of cuss words. Papa and uncle said we we're gonna wait until they go to sleep, then try to make a run for it. I gather from this that the bombs must have dropped in the last terminal entry. It sounds like the entire family had been sleeping in the attic, as quiet as they can be, so that nobody noticed them. It must have been working because it sounds like people entered the house thinking that it was abandoned. Were these raiders with a kidnapped victim? There was a fight. They broke a bunch of stuff. There were a whole lot of cuss words. That night, Kim, his father, his mother, his uncle Marshall, his cousin Mikey, all left their house in Natick Banks and fled. We never learn where they went or if they survived. We don't know what happened to his aunt Song. Did she die in the internment camp? If she got out, did she ever make it back to Natick Banks? What was her reaction when she came back to her home to find strangers there and her entire family missing? The events in this terminal are clearly modeled after the internment of Japanese Americans that happened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor during World War II. That's a very dark chapter in American history. Years later, President Ronald Reagan apologized on behalf of the American government, admitting that it was wartime hysteria and a failure of leadership that led to the imprisonment of our own citizens during wartime. And he issued reparations, which eventually paid billions of dollars to survivors and their offspring of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. 
That, of course, is a positive move, but it can't undo the horrible damage that was done to the Japanese-American community at that time. But unlike the real world, the fake world of Fallout 4 is far darker. Here we do not find a government that admits its guilt, that tries to make right the wrong that they've done. Here we don't find a government that could even for a moment consider that what they are doing to their own citizens could in any way be wrong. Instead, we find a government and a population fueled by wartime hysteria and racial prejudice. A government that is happy to watch prejudiced people tear down the heritage of a subculture in this nation that will raid the homes of private citizens, put them in buses and drag them off to concentration camps, where those people stayed likely until the very day the bombs dropped. What happened to all of those people who were in those internment camps? Is it possible that they are still there? In some future Fallout game, will we come upon a Chinese-American internment camp where we find the ghouls of all of the people rounded up at gunpoint and shoved in a small camp? Those of you who have played the Fallout New Vegas DLC Old World Blues already know the answer to that question. In that DLC, we find a place called Little Yangtze. This is an internment camp for Chinese American citizens. When you arrive, you discover that all of the Chinese Americans have been turned into ghouls or died. The survivors, probably terrified by your presence, instantly attack. But as soon as they get near the gate, their heads explode. That's because the United States government put slave collars around their necks. You can clear the entire camp simply by luring them outside the camp. The United States not only interred these citizens, but were violent to them and used them for scientific experiments. We find a graveyard of dozens upon dozens of dead Chinese American citizens. Remember, these are not communist soldiers. These are not necessarily communist spies. These were American citizens who just so happened to have Chinese ancestry. They were rounded up, placed in this camp, equipped with slave collars, experimented on, many of them died, and were buried here, and those that lived turned into ghouls until you show up and their heads explode when they attack you. This is not headcanon. This is not a mod. This is Fallout lore, and it's dreadful. There's a lot to explore in Attic Banks. It's an interesting town. I hope you got to see much of it while I told this horrible story about what happened to Chinese Americans during the Great War. If you head north of Natick Banks, you find the Roadside Pines Motel, which is swarming with raiders. This is an interesting location in that you almost always find a raider with a missile launcher on the roof, and you always find one raider with a suit of raider power armor. Clearing this place is a guaranteed way to get a suit of Raider Power Armor. Additionally, you can get repeat suits of Raider Power Armor if you kill the Raider before he or she enters the suit of Power Armor. Then, the next time you return, a new Raider will spawn with a new set of Power Armor so that each time you return, you have the chance to find a brand new set of Power Armor. In this way, you can generate Raider Power Armor that you can then use for your companions or for your settlers. If you head due west of Natick Banks, you first stumble upon a warehouse, which usually has a death clog guarding it. And then eventually you'll stumble upon a power plant. Sometimes you'll find a Deathclaw and a super mutant behemoth fighting, and other times you simply find them wandering around. Also of note, just north of the power plant, we find an abandoned private residence. This place is also guarded by a death claw. I'm gonna rip your lips off. You know how to show a girl a good time. Which means that if you completely clear the Natick Banks area, you can kill four Death Claws, one Super Mutant Behemoth, and a slew of ghouls, super mutants, and raiders. There's a lot to explore here. At this private residence, we can kill a bunch of ghouls, and disturbingly, in one of the buildings, we find the remains of a suicide. Here we find a man who hanged himself. He tied a noose in the rafters above, put his head in it, kicked the box out from under him, and then either his neck snapped from the weight, or there he hung until he died from asphyxiation. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the tragic and full story of the Natick Banks town, the Pearwood Residences, the Roadside Pines Motel, and the fate of young Kim Woo. We learned that it wasn't just private corporations that were truly, despicably evil before the bombs dropped, but also the United States government. We learned in my recent video on the Robobrain Lab that the United States military was conducting experiments on incarcerated citizens, chopping open their skulls and taking out their brains. And in this episode, we learned that the government itself was using the police force to round up Chinese-American U.S. citizens and place them in camps. Clearly, there was little good worth saving. But we must remember that despite the evils done by people before the bombs dropped, that there were still so many normal people who just wanted to live their lives, who wanted to do their jobs and love their families, who were not caught up in the power of petty politics, who were not caught up in the profits of large corporations, but who were still caught up in the nuclear fire that rained down upon the just and the unjust equally. What are your thoughts on young Kim Woo? Are you as horrified as I was to read this story? Or do you think that this act was somehow justified? Let me know in the comment section below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. I publish a new video every single day of the week, so if you like this video and you want to be notified when I publish my next one, be sure to subscribe. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I just recently released a new line of Oxhorn t-shirts. You can find a link to those t-shirts in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers can access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.